Hi guys. Well, maybe the second time is going to be a charm here. Let me start this all over again. For the second time in the past hour, uh, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization as we tiptoe into the fall of 2020. It is now Wednesday, September 23rd, 2020, on this gorgeous but wildfire smoke clouded, beautiful early fall of 2020 day in Ithaca, New York, looking at wildfire smoke from 3,000 miles away. And oh yes, I am Sam Mitchell, and you have stumbled into Collapse Chronicles and where the little dog and I uh, do what we do every day, and that's to chronicle the collapse of a planet. So we're going to go right over here to the third biggest story on the mainstream media today. Now, the second biggest story on the mainstream media on the planet was how a grizzly bear killed a hunter inside of a U.S. national park. I'm a little bit unclear what a hunter was doing inside a national park hunting. But anyway, the bear took care of that. Thank you for the chuckle of the day. But then they uh, get serious on the third biggest story of the planet, right here from the good old New York Times. And I'm quite sure I am not the only doomer down here in the... Uh, in this rabbit hole going over this story from the New York Times today. Now, of course, I understand, guys, if you are listening to a channel called uh, Collapse Chronicles, this is ABCs to you, but, uh, you know, good for the New York Times uh, and Yahoo News, just right here spelling out what is going on on this planet. Now, this is a long, long involved story. I could turn this into a two-hour rant. Uh, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. I'm going to put the link onto it and highly advise you, especially book hermits, to read this, uh, this long story explaining the situation on this planet. Uh, but if you want to sit around, I, I'm going to do this for about 30 minutes, and I, we're not going to get into the obvious hopium showing up towards the end. So take it away, New York Times Science Desk. <clears throat> Climate disruption is now locked in. The next moves, the next moves will be crucial. Okay, take it away, New York Times. America, and I would say the entire planet, is now under siege by climate change in ways that scientists have warned about for years. But there is a second part to their admonition. Decades of growing crises are already locked in to the global ecosystem and cannot, cannot be reversed. This means the kinds of cascading disasters occurring today are no longer features of some dystopian future. They are the here and now worsening for the next generation and perhaps longer, depending on humanity's willingness to take action. So this, this term willingness, now of course that uh, there, there's a second part, there's the ability, and whether or not you are one of these uh, techno-utopians, like some of these clueless morons they interview, uh, assuming it was, we were able to turn this freight train around, which uh, the New York Times is basically saying we, we aren't, even if we were able 
the question is, will we do it? And uh, even if the answer to the first question was yes, which is BS, the answer to the second question is no. Uh, and, and the New York Times knows this damn well. Uh, humanity's willingness to take action. <clears throat> so, uh, and we're going to hear from a bunch of folks in this article. This is Peter Kalmus, a climatologist from LA, blah, blah, blah. Uh, quote, I have been labeled an alarmist, and I think it's a lot harder for people other than book hermit to say that I am being alarmist now, close quote. Uh, then what they do is they just take a, you know, just a brief run over the summer of 2020. I think we, we know uh, what the, you know, the laundry list of the summer of 2020. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, unclear about this statement from the New York Times. The con conversations about climate change have broken into everyday life. Everyday life, I have heard virtually zero mention of climate change from anybody, you know, in my everyday life outside of the doomosphere. To the top of the headlines, well, at least we have that today, and, the, and this hilarious knee slapper, center stage in the presidential campaign. I, I don't know what the uh, reporters and editors at New York Times, what they have been smoking. Anyway, the questions are profound and urgent. Okay, so these are some of the questions the New York Times is asking. So I am going to answer the questions. Question number one on the New York Times mind, can this be reversed? <clears throat> the answer is no, it cannot be reversed, and if it could be, it would not be. Okay, question number two. What can be done to minimize the looming dangers for the decades ahead? Okay, if you are a human, there is one thing you can do to minimize the dangers, at least for your unborn children, and that is do not breed. Preferably sterilize yourself and the rest of the, uh, of the human race, and at least you will be doing the only thing at this point to lessen the dangers to humans, although every other earthling we share this planet with is going to be on their own. Okay, question number three. Will the destruction of recent weeks, meaning the summer of 2020, become a moment of reckoning or just a blip in the news cycle? The answer to that question is all of the above. All right. So the New York Times spoke with two dozen climate experts, including scientists, economists. I did not realize that economists were climate experts, but according to the New York Times, economists are climate experts, sociologists, and policymakers, and their answers were, by turns, you know, and I think we can figure out which group of people uh, made these kind of answers alarming, cynical, and hopeful. And hopeful, as I say, you can go on the link to read uh, the hopium. Okay, so they start out with good old uh, climate scientist and proud mother of four, this clueless moron, Catherine Hayhoe, from the good old state of Texas. <clears throat> Quote, It's as if we have been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for decades. 
close quote. But, she added, quote, we are not dead yet. There you go. That is, that, that is a hopeful comment from a climatologist mother of four. We are not dead yet. Yet being the operative word in that sentence. All right. <clears throat> Their most sobering message, okay, the takeaway, most sobering message from these 24 interviews is that the world still has not seen the worst of it. But the other part of the takeaway, gone, gone is the climate of yesteryear and there is no going back. The effects of climate change evident today are the results of choices that countries made decades ago to keep pumping heat trapping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at ever increasing rates despite warnings from scientists about the price to be paid. That more, that price, more vicious heat waves, longer wildfire seasons, rising sea levels, blah, 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 is now irretrievably baked in. Nations, including the good old US of A, have dithered so long in cutting emissions that progressively more global warming is assured for decades to come, even if efforts to shift away from fossil fuels were accelerated tomorrow. Uh, and, and this is the, you know, this is at the root of uh, the bright green lies that uh, shifting away from fossil fuels, while that is a noble goal, will make no difference at this point. It is irretrievably baked in. Every bit of this stuff we're sending into the atmosphere today will start showing up and kicking our ass in about 2050. All right, let's listen to good old Jonathan Overpeck from a climate scientist at the University of Michigan. Quote, what we are seeing today, this year, is just a small harbinger of what we are likely to get. Close quote. Overpeck says things are on track to get, quote, twice as bad, if not worse, close quote, as they are now. And uh, this is uh, people calling me to rent this little cabin. If you want to rent this cabin, that's why I was interrupted last time. Send me an email and we'll talk about if you want to rent this place. Okay, let's get back to, uh, to the business at hand. Um, okay, the most optimistic proposals made by world governments to zero out emissions envision holding warming below two degrees Celsius, but nations remain far from achieving those goals. Do you think so? Uh, usually each passing year's records are framed by the, pa by the past. However, as Christian Protescu uh, from the University of Illinois says it may be time to flip that chronological framing 
you know, basing all of uh, our predictions on past events uh, and consider using today as the new starting point. Do you think so? Uh, quote, don't think of this as the warmest month of August in California in the last century. Think of it as one of the coolest months of August in California over the next century. So that, that is one way. It is not the hottest uh, month uh, of the past 100 years. It is the coolest month for the next 100 years. I do like that. Uh, climate change is, well at least now, more a slope than a cliff, exports did agree. We are still, according to the New York Times, far from any sort of game over moment where it's too late to act. We were, we were at the game over mo moment uh, by 1970, certainly by 2000. Uh, it was game over for this planet. But of course, you know, we have to have all of this hopium so the New York Times can continue to sell ads to uh, clueless morons. So I guess they already uh, they they already start digging for the hopium, I mean, and this is hilarious that they're interviewing some of the very people I have interviewed on Collapse Chronicles. Uh, you know, looking for filling the hopium pipe, talking about ways that we can still hold on to a thriving civilization. Yes, you can, uh, but let's get back to reality. They go back and forth from reality to knee-slapping optimism. Okay, but, you know, to preserve a thriving civilization in the 21st century, it will not be easy, huh? Particularly if the past is the prologue. Managing climate change, experts said, will require rethinking virtually every single aspect of daily life. How and where our homes are built, how power grids are designed, how people plan for the future with the collective good in mind. Yes, we can certainly see that in the uh, presidential election. It, meaning preserving a thriving civilization in the 21st century, I guess is what they mean by it, will require an epical shift in politics in a country and on a planet that has, on the whole until now, ignored climate change. Yes. And, uh, so anyway, guys, as I say, it, it, I, I can make this a two-hour rant, so you can go on the, uh, the link yourself if you are a hopium smoker. Uh, obviously, the New York Times is not, you know, uh, going to tell the whole truth. Uh, but at least they are telling half the truth. So we're going, I'm just going to feature the half of this article where the even the New York Times has uh, the balls to handle the truth. Okay, uh, then uh, what they do is now they continue to take a, uh, a romp across the summer 
of 2020. So I guess that 3.6 million acres uh, have burned in California so far this year with uh, three more months left to go. Uh, 3.6 million acres. Uh, talking about how the fires have destroyed entire towns. And, and we've, we know this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's move on. Okay. For a long time, God, where was it? For a long time, this is Catherine Mock, associate professor from University of Miami, blah, blah, blah. Uh, quote, there was so much focus on how climate change would affect the most vulnerable, like low-lying nations or coral reefs, things that don't dramatically affect the economic powerhouses of the world. There's often been this arrogant assumption that wealth provides pro protection. Uh, close quote. Recent events, she said, are a vivid reminder that we are all in this together. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, the the one-tenth of one percenters really consider themselves part of this. Uh, then they get back in uh, to some hopium. Okay, but getting past the hopium, what will, once again, what does this mean that we would have to do. Assuming we can do this, the question is, will humanity rise to this challenge even if we could, which we can't? All right. First, the experts broadly agreed that if we want to stop our planet from relentlessly heating up forever, humanity will quickly need to eliminate emissions of planet-warming greenhouse gases. That means cleaning up every coal plant in China, every steel mill in Europe, every single car and truck in the United States. This is a staggering task. It means reorienting our global economy that depends on fossil fuels. Hmm. Yes. But experts also made a point they say is often underappreciated. Even if we start radically slashing emissions today, Today, it could be decades before those changes start to appreciably slow the rate at which the Earth is warming. Yes, in the meantime, we will have to deal with effects that continue to worsen. You know, the effects that we're seeing today were, were put into motion in about 1990 as the effects we will be seeing in 2050 are the ones we're putting in motion today. And do the math here. Uh, okay, this is Juan Declet Barreto uh, from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you, Juan. Here we go. In terms of being reversible, I can only think of things in sci-fi films, Superman trying to spin the earth in the other direction so Lois Lane does not die. Seriously, it is not reversible. Close quote. 
thank you, the New York Times having the guts to be quoting the Union of Concerned Scientists seriously, it is not reversible. Okay, I think I have found the title to this video. Again and again, climate scientists have shown that our choices now, right now in 2020, climate scientists have shown that our choices now range from merely awful to incomprehensible, ir incomprehensibly horrible. Those are our choices. That is our rain, the, the best case scenario choice at this point is merely awful, but of course, incomprehensibly horrible uh, will be the, the choice uh, tomorrow. Okay, if we do, okay, if we do cut emissions rapidly, about one-seventh of the world's population will suffer severe heat waves every few years, and failure to cut our emissions rapidly doubles or triples that number. If we act now, sea levels could rise another one to two feet this century. If we don't act now, Antarctica's ice sheets could destabilize irreversibly, and ocean levels could keep rising at an exorable pace for centuries, making coastal civilization all but unmanageable. Yes, the best hope now, the best hope now is to slow the pace of warming enough to maintain some control for humanity. Uh, so we talk about that hopium for a while. Uh, so even as nations cut emissions, they will also need to accelerate efforts to adapt to the climate change they can no longer avoid. Yes. Uh, did you get the bug or not? Did you finally get that bug? Did you snap him out of the air? Sancho has been trying to bite that fly for about three days. Okay. Uh, then they talk about these hilarious, hilarious uh, efforts that humanity, you know, what they have to do uh, to find any, any notion of adapting to the tsunami heading our way, going to Bangladesh looking uh, <laughs> looking for a hopium. Anyway, moving ahead. But as this case in Bangladesh illustrates, adaptation is usually a reactive measure, not a preventive one. Adapting to climate change means envisioning bigger disasters to come. Again, flipping the framing away from history and into the future. Uh, okay, let's hear from Alice Hill at the Council of Foreign Relations. Yes, uh, blah, blah, blah. Humans have difficulty imagining things that we have not experienced yet. Uh huh. This also applies to climate change. It is hard to visualize the entire west coast of flame until you actually see it. And if we can't see it, we tend to discount the risk, close quote. 
uh, let's see, then they uh, talk about how long uh, scientists have been warning us about this day of reckoning. As early as the 1850s, researchers realized that greenhouse gases could trap heat on Earth. This came at the dawn of the Industrial Age, uh, which brought fossil fuel burning factories that ultimately not only filled people's lives with modern conveniences, but also filled the sky with the very carbon dioxide now warming the world. And by the 1990s, scientists had a deep understanding of the future risk of a warming world. By the 2010s, researchers could show how the extreme heat waves, droughts, and floods now unfolding were influenced by climate change. Uh, and, and here we are uh, in 2020. Uh, <clears throat> yet governments have been slow to rein in reliance on fossil fuels. I wonder why this is that this first guy we heard from, Kalmus, quote, I feel like the climate scientists have kind of done our job. We have laid it out pretty clearly, but nobody is doing anything. So now it's kind of up to the social scientist. Yes. Uh, will the recent spate of disasters be enough to shock voters? and politicians into action. This is one of the social scientists, Dr. Garrard, who I skipped over earlier. Quote, we have a lot of evidence that that does not happen. Do you think so? Uh, one 2017 study did find that people who experience extreme weather are more likely to support climate adaptations me adaptation measures than before, but that effect, you know, even from people who have had their asses kicked, diminished over time. Yes. Uh, Susan Cutter, who directs the Hazards and Vulnerability Research Institute at University of South Carolina, noted that climate change's biggest problem may be the sense that it is beyond our control now. The planet is burning, so does it really matter if I turn off the light? Quote, there is too much complexity and frankly, too much that needs to be changed that we are flitting from one concern to another." Close quote. Then uh, they wind up with the hopium, which I will not I will not insult my intelligence or yours with the uh, unadulterated BS uh, hopium that humans can or will do anything to turn this freight train around. It's right here in the New York Times, guys. But anyway, if you appreciated what the New York Times had to tell you about the, your future and the future for your little darlings, please send the New York Times some love and some thumbs up to this video. If you would like to uh, subscribe to Collapse Chronicles for more doom and gloom, we would love to have you aboard. And uh, for anybody who has ever supported my work, I want to thank uh, kind-hearted 
tribes member Dan from Australia for that kind birthday gift yesterday supporting my work on YouTube. I really, really do appreciate the few of you who have ever supported my work on this channel. But anyway, that being said, I need to wrap up uh, this edition of Collapse Chronicles and uh, I think I have a factory farmed pig I need to go cook for my lunch. Bye guys.